Welcome to DeFine, the podcast making the most important projects in DeFi easy to understand and accessible to all. Every episode, we sit down with a team who are building to solve important issues of our modern societies. For our first guest, we have Luigi Denorio de Mayo, Director of DeFi at Everlabs, the team behind Avalanche, the blockchain claiming to be the fastest smart contract platform with the aim of digitizing all the world's assets. So if you were at a, uh, let's say, a dinner party and you were talking to someone who had never really, you know, that heard about, uh, as I'm sure, you know, you've probably had this type of conversation before, someone that, you know, they've heard about Bitcoin in the news, they've heard about Ethereum, but, you know, they, they don't know two things about, say, DeFi. You know, how would you explain to them what you do and, and, and what you're working on? So that's a, good, that's a great question. Um, in terms of, of kind of what, I, you know, I'm working on particular at Avalanche is, you know, if you especially want to take it into the context of Bitcoin, I kind of view Bitcoin as this, uh, this entry level um, opener for everybody. It was the easiest to understand. Uh, it's still, to me, the most dominant uh, in, in all of crypto because the story behind it's quite powerful, frankly, of how it started and kind of how it still continued to operate from a decentralized aspect. But I think, you know, as we've continued along along this path over the past so 13 years, 14 years, something like that, uh, we kind of understood that there's much more to do with blockchains than just uh, having a, uh, a store of value or, you know, or digital cash as they originally intended it to be. So I think, you know, especially for Avalanche here and, you know, kind of piggybacking off of what happened with Ethereum and, 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 and what Vitalik brought to the table, Avalanche kind of does something completely different from a consensus perspective. It is not proof of work. It's a proof of stake chain, but also provides a consensus layer that can be very fast, cheap, and decentralized. And those are three very important things that we don't currently have. Um, most of these chains can become centralized quite quickly uh, just by nature of how they're constructed. Avalanche, uh, you know, the consensus that was really thought up the algorithm does not necessarily require that. So right now we have over a thousand validators and the chain isn't a, a year, not even a year old. And, uh, you know, that's pretty impressive from my perspective. I think it's the largest validator set across all of crypto. But we also have very fast transaction speeds and a lot of customizability to the chain. So just to take it, you know, high level again, the reason I'm so passionate about what we're doing in Avalanche and kind of what, what attracted me to the space and here is because I think Bitcoin opened my eyes, Ethereum really opened my eyes, and then you know, until until after Ethereum, I didn't see many layer one chains, so to speak, that were very interesting or intriguing to me. Um, but Avalanche really stood out because I think it's prepared and flexible enough to be an actual technology layer that can solve a lot of problems in the future. Right. And and so, you know, if if you were trying to explain to, you know, this, this person that you just met um, at the dinner party, what, you know, what would you say that Avalanche is solving at, at a high level? That they, in mm -hmm. a way that they could understand. Yeah, I think I think what it's solving is the ability to digitize all assets over the world, all over the world. So you could think of that as a bunch of things. You could think of that as stocks. You could think of that as bonds. You could think of that as uh, real estate. Uh, you could think of it as steps, walking steps. You could think of it as you know, really anything can be digitized into an asset, right? NFTs, collectibles. Uh, all these things, like we're, you know, we're obviously we've done something with Tops, one of the largest collectibles companies in the world, to have NFTs. You know, you used to go to the grocery store and get baseball cards while your mom was paying on the line, and now, you know, you, you can just do that online and actually have it be an NFT uh, on an on a decentralized chain. So our goal is to digitize all these assets and do it in a way that's actually decentralized that can stand the test of time. Because once you do digitize these assets, you want to make sure that it's on a chain that is going to be around for a long time and can scale. There's there's a lot of important kind of things that, that like that you've touched on. So I mean, I, I guess I guess my next question is, you know, obviously, you know, Avalanche is is one of the chains that's trying to achieve this, and it'd be interesting to know, you know, what led Avalabs to the point of, of deciding or to, to what was the origin of Avalabs? I mean, at what point did you guys say, you know, okay, there are some other guys doing this, you know, obviously Ethereum, 
and and what was the kind of problem that that you guys set out to solve? Yeah, so I mean, I wasn't here at the time, but uh, Emin Gunsir, who's uh, who's the co-founder and CEO, uh, he's very well known in the crypto space. Is uh, he was involved in the, writing the fifty one percent selfish mining paper on Bitcoin uh, and and a lot of other uh, things, especially like the the DAO hack. He was involved in a lot of uh, things and, and, and is very well known distributed systems professor out of Cornell. So him and uh, some PhD students uh, worked on this. I, I guess they saw this avalanche consensus paper that dropped and they knew that this was special um, and that they can use this paper to sort of um, kind of deliver the next get the next generation of consensus. So the way they, the way they view it and the way I view it is you have con- classical consensus, which is really fast. Um, but can't scale. And then you had Nakamoto consensus, which came, which came around with Bitcoin. And, and that's, you know, much more secure and, and decentralized, but, but not so fast. And, you know, they think that avalanche consensus is a third iteration of that, which provides, you know, speed and scale uh, and security. So um, it really started from Cornell University, uh, Emin and, 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 some, and some PhD students. And, and, they saw the vision of digitizing assets and they saw the ability to have a fast layer one chain, which still today does not really, really exist at scale. That's you know, super interesting. You know, there's this kind of this clear vision of, of being able to, to digitize assets. I guess a, an important question to ask there is what problem does that solve? It, you know, if we went again with this, uh, you know, analogy of speaking to someone at a at a dinner party, and and you were trying to explain the importance of that, you know, that that vision of digitizing assets at scale. Yeah, what problems is that going to solve in the real world, or what implications will that have? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of implications. It's a good question. So, you know, there's a lot of problems with the way the the internet is kind of constructed right now. Uh, you think like, you know, you could think of like Facebook, you could think of uh, all these uh, giant technology companies, which currently own data uh, on all their users, users and monetize that data. Obviously, with, you know, what we're trying to do in the decentralized world is we're trying to decentralize all that power out and such that it can't be monetized at the user's expense, but rather uh, they can benefit from all the things that they're doing online. So that that's you know, an overarching goal, Facebook being one example of something that, Mm -hmm. you know, or even Uber, Airbnb, all these things are are effectively middlemen. And and that's essentially what a decentralized protocol is. Like you think of something like Aave. Aave is a decentralized protocol that connects lenders and borrowers across crypto. Now, there's no reason you can't have something like that for Uber, you know, and and not have to pay a, a fee to to the to the you know to the corporation but have that actually get paid to the protocol and everybody you know um one example i like to use is imagine all the uber drivers owned all the uber stock when uber had the ipo rather than all the investors right i mean Mm -hmm. that's kind of the difference or one of the big differences between crypto and uh and essentially the way the traditional world works it's where you kind of get paid for your work and you can benefit from being an early adopter and uh, I think that's that's incredibly beneficial, and that's something that can be done on Avalanche. Like we have this feature called subnets, where you can effectively set up your own subnet. Let's say you're Uber and you want to set up your own subnet, and you can customize criteria on mm-hmm. many things, such as like jurisdiction or whether or not you want them KYC. These are all things that are programmable um, and can be much faster than like 4,500 transactions per second. So. So that's like similar to sort of a permissioned versus a permissionless. Um, yes, but there, there's certain nuances. Like, right. you know, you can also validate the main chain if you're a validator of subnet. And, and you know, but you can also create your own token on a subnet. There's a lot of customizability uh, that'll be coming out um, and, and be announced shortly. But, but yeah, it's uh, it's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, 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 definitely. So, I mean, just to touch on a couple of those ideas you mentioned like so do you see that you know like say uber and and facebook and these other companies that you mentioned do you think that you know do you think that the shelf life of of kind of centralized companies in the in the sense of centralized in the sense of how they treat user data do you think that the shelf life of these companies is limited oh that's a good question Uh, i'm not sure if it's limited Uh, i think there'll always be some sort of intersection between the traditional world and, and kind of what's going on in the crypto world right now 
Mm-hmm. But I do think that um, you know we'll slow. You know, the decentralized world will slowly eat away at kind of that that moat. That moat. I think it's a good good way of putting it. That that the traditional world has. You know, like, right. It's very hard for Uber to compete with a, a decentralized Uber over time. Such you know, so long as there's you know, good incentives structured and and network effects and crypto's already done a good job at network effects and mm-hmm. liquidity mining programs and and other mechanisms have made it such that it's pretty pretty uh possible to kind of get network effects quite quickly yeah and and do you think that you know i think like vitalik raised this point a couple of weeks ago at the ECC conference in in paris that he thinks that there should be more kind of focus on applications for blockchains outside of of finance and so I mean, what's like, what's your personal view or, or, you know, Everlab's view on how DeFi is DeFi, you know, the kind of the first iteration of, of applications for blockchains, like, you know, what's, what's the view there? Like, is that, is that something that you guys want to eventually, uh, to, to get into? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. And it's a theme that uh, I think is top of mind for, for many folks. Um, for me, a lot of what we had thought about in 2016 and 17, when Ethereum really started to gain some traction of all the possibilities of what could be decentralized, mm-hmm. you know, none of that, none of that ever stopped existing. Meaning, like that, from my perspective, I never thought that that's stuff that we can't do anymore. Like that's all stuff that we can still do. So, like, let's take a step back and and think about decentralized Uber, decentralized Airbnb, decentralized Facebook, decentralized, you know, all, all these companies can be decentralized. We just couldn't do it in 2017. We really didn't have any infrastructure. There was no Uniswap available. I'm pretty sure Chainlink mainnet wasn't live. There was no scalable layer one. So you really, even if you had everything lined up, even if Facebook themselves wanted to convert, you really just didn't have the infrastructure available to do these things. So I do mm-hmm. think the next natural place to to go in terms of, of what can be done is, is is social. I think it's the most logical way to go. And if you think about it, you could do some pretty fascinating liquidity mining programs with social uh, networks and, and really, you know, scale up the adoption quite quickly. And given all of the, you know, issues that social networks have had, you know, through elections right. and, and all these things, you know, it, it, it'd be really valuable to have a protocol, a social protocol, where, you know, I think of it like the UI layer could kind of be your filter. So, you know, if you want to view things, if you don't want to see, you know, uh, hate crimes, you can have a UI layer that doesn't allow that to be seen. But the protocol itself wouldn't be um, wouldn't be stopping that, you know, wouldn't be halting that information coming through. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and what, what would a, a liquidity mining program for a social network look like in in your in your view? Yeah, I mean, depending on how it to be structured, yeah, I think you could do a bunch of things, right? Like you can, you know, mine the coin for work. So, uh, you know, activity on the network. Let's say for Facebook, they have the marketplace, and the more uh, objects you sell on the marketplace, you could be mining. Let's call it that social token. Mm-hmm. Um, you could also uh, do it in such a way where you do a joint liquidity mining program between the layer one and and the actual uh, and the actual social network, just to kind of bootstrap it and get people to use it. Because that's the hardest part. You could build something really special, but especially for a social network, mm-hmm. a lot of people don't adopt it quite quickly. It's quite boring. So it's like going to the bar by yourself. You know, I think this is is interesting. The interesting thing here is we've kind of, in a roundabout way, answered the the question that I that I asked earlier about if you were explaining the idea of the, or the importance of digitizing assets at scale, right? Like at least the way that I'm kind of interpreting what you're saying is that essentially, you know, Avalanche and and potentially other, you know other other blockchains are kind of financializing or or monetizing a lot of the untapped value in the internet right now. That's right. You know, and that value could be a lot of things. It could be, you know, it could be, like I said, your steps of walking. You know, it could be uh, you know, your thoughts. It could be your time on a computer. Um, there's a lot of things that can still be digitized or mined or, or generated, so to speak. And uh, and I think that can can kind of really change the way we view our time spent or our value spent, our experiences, you know, like. Uh, 
you think about uh, unused things in the world. So let's say you have an apartment and, uh, and you know, it's a second apartment of yours and you weren't using it. Airbnb untapped the potential of that, that apartment, right. For certain mm -hmm. time periods. That's one example of what some of these decentralized protocols and, and things will be able to untap, right? Like you can have your, your laptop running in the background and sending energy to other places, but doing this all in a way that doesn't pay a random entity in the middle, in the middle. So, and when you remove those entities from the middle, you kind of, you, you really increase productivity mm -hmm. and uh, your bang for your buck of everything you're building goes up. Do you do you see like say this this kind of decentralization of of you know of markets like what implications do you think that will have for for like equality for instance? Oh man, that's 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 much tougher. Right, equality is tough in general just because you know a lot of these markets right now are set up such that uh, you know the rich kind of get richer. You know, the more you, the more you have, the more you mm -hmm. you know the easier it is to get more. But with that said you know, it also uh, provides inclusion, right? Like we can airdrop things to, you know, un, you know, um, very unfortunate people in the world and then people who, you know, are, are struggling. That's a mechanism by which it was much more difficult to do. So, you know, you don't have to give it to a centralized charity. You could literally have people with, digit, you know, they set up a digitized wallet and you airdrop drop them, you know, coins, that have value, whether or not that's something that's new to, to bootstrap something. I'm actually just making that up as I talk right now, but you know, you kind of think about, you can kind of think about like airdropping a soup kitchen, you know, and, and their participation can kind of be done by that. But like, that's something that can happen. But in terms of equality, the biggest benefit of crypto for equality is like for me to protect against nation states and inflation. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, Think about the ability to buy a stable coin in Venezuela or a place that you know has very high inflation. That's just something that was very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. uh, only a few years back, there was no way to really diversify, or it was much harder to. So having that ability to diversify assets is quite, quite, quite unique and special. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was just, you know, as you were talking about some of these potential like applications, especially like social networks, I was kind of thinking about how. Obviously, what's kind of largely prevented um, a lot of blockchains from being used for this type of stuff is this is the scalability question, right? And so, obviously, I mean, you guys, you know, you guys at Avalanche are trying to solve this. I, I one, you know, one kind of question I had is at Avalanche, how do you guys view? You know, there's a lot of like speculation around. You know, there will be this kind of like dot com style consolidation of infrastructure, and that there'll be your your Googles, and there'll be you know your your Facebooks, and your kind of uh, your your winners. And like at Avalanche, you know, how do you guys view the future of blockchains, and where does Avalanche tie tie into that future? Yeah, that's that's a hard one. Um, that's a, you're asking all the right questions, and the ones that I really spend a lot of time thinking about. You know. Uh, even if you look at the landscape today, you, you do see value really accrue to certain high level things. Uh, and, you know, like there's like five or six dApps that control a large amount of TVL. Um, naturally speaking, human beings work in that way. And part of that is because network effects need to be present. And in order to have network effects, everybody kind of needs to be operating in the same sort of thing, right? Like mm -hmm. an Ave without, you know, a, frag a fragmented Ave is not is not very beneficial um, or less beneficial than if it actually has a lot of liquidity. So that that's a legit, legitimate problem. But what's special about crypto is a lot of it can, and DeFi in particular is a lot of it can be composable. Um, so, you know, with that composability, you have the you know, ability to, you know, kind of connect all these different ap applications in a way that makes it a seamless user experience for the user. And I think that can be uh, unique because plugging Google and Facebook and all these things together is possible, but can also be just shut down at any point. And, uh, and partnerships need to have first been agreed to, et cetera. So that's much more complicated. Uh, in terms of the layer ones, it's a really interesting thought and question. But from my perspective at a high level, you kind of, you need more than one layer one. You need more than two. You need more than three. If we're going mm -hmm. to put Uber, 
uh, Facebook and all these things on chains, there's just no chain right now that can handle all that scale. You know, Avalanche is unique in the sense that, you know, it can actually just continue. It's a DAG and it can continue to scale with subnets. But, you know, you're still going to have certain things that um, are more are more suited to one layer, one versus another. Um, so I do think that there'll be a lot of chains in the future and, 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 and rails, so to speak. And I don't know if I completely answered your question because maybe I don't know the answer, but. Right, right. Um, I mean, you know, everyone, <laughs> I feel like everyone in the space is kind of speculating and, you know, and obviously, you know, everyone wants to be working on a project that's, that's going to be around in the future. So, you know, what, like at, at that, at this point, you know, like, you know, you kind of mentioned that a key part is kind of building, um, uh, building out like an ecosystem of, of kind of, of apps that are, in, you know, interoperable. So, you know, it'd be, it'd be kind of interesting to hear about what you guys are building. I mean, I think to, to the layman in, 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 in the space, you know, Avalanche sort of hit headlines pretty hard last year for, you know, having a big raise and, and everything. And it'd be kind of interesting to, to, to hear more about um, how things are progressing and, and, and yeah, some of those things that you're working on. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, that's perfect tee up. So, uh, you know, we've kind of just been quietly building um, a lot of infrastructure pieces that were needed for the DeFi ecosystem uh, in particular. And that's kind of my focus, but we've also been working on some, some enterprise things. Like I mentioned, the NFT thing for tops, but on the DeFi side, you know, we kind of organically have grown our, 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 our DeFi ecosystem. There's been no incentives deployed thus far from our side we've we essentially we had chain link mainnet go live a few weeks ago so awesome. with that yeah so we never we, we we stole right to the second don't have lending platform live but that's going to be changing in a week so we will have lending live next week and, and and chain link and we've deployed a new bridge to ethereum which is uh pretty revolutionary technology uh it's very fast and cheap at least five times faster and cheaper than our previous bridge. And, you know, I did a test transaction for a few hundred dollars moving from Ethereum to Avalanche. And it cost me I think a dollar 40 to come over. And yeah, it was 10 minutes it took on the Ethereum side, which is standard for a block. Um, but it took 19 seconds on the Avalanche side. And it was, and, and, and the UI and UX experience is pretty neat because it kind of gives you alerts throughout the whole process. So you're not sitting there waiting what happened to your coins. But like, these are the type of things we're building and we're building for the long term uh, rather than, you know, just trying to fast follow. We're, we're focused on really making this a, a special chain long term. And I think that, you know, we have a lot to announce over, over this month. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll tee that up and leave that, you know, for the announcements to come out. But uh, we have a lot of exciting things coming um, that we've kind of been laying the Lego pieces up for. And uh, and now we'll start to, I think, uh, harvest, so to speak, some of the rewards from from all that work. Yeah, amazing. And and I mean, you know, without kind of spoiling any of the uh, the news that you mm-hmm. have to share, like, you know, what are some of the things you're excited about within the, the DeFi space that you guys are building or working on right now? Uh, yeah, a lot of things. But I mean, most most what I'm most excited about is, is actually this chain. I, I really, I really think that it's it's fascinating to me. Like nobody really cares about security until they care about security. You know, today we have the six hundred million dollar hack. You know, after, you know, now everybody's going to be focused on security for a few days. But you know, like once that goes away, everybody's like, oh, it's not fast enough. Like we need to just focus on speed. And this is constant balance in the space. And you know, we're, we sit from a p- perspective and position of. Our chain net is secure and it's fast. And, you know, I think as people realize like why we all came into this space and that decentralization matters, they'll start to really like continuously look at Avalanche as a, a, a real solution for that. So, so, so I, you know, that's what's fascinating to me is like people kind of forget about security and decentralization right. for times and then they come back to it. And Avalanche is, is one the one in my in my opinion, right? That they're going to come back to and be like, wow, that's like that's the chain that's gonna be special from this perspective. And if we are decentralized, you know, that's really what you want DeFi running on, right? Because if if you have all of DeFi running on a chain that, you know, two nodes operate, you really have a house of cards. No doubt, yeah. And I think that is, you know, that is quite a 
an important you know discussion the you know the kind of the trade off between sc- scalability and 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 decentralization you know that's something that's been talked about for a long time and i guess i guess on on that note like in the last few years you know w- you know we had this kind of big spike of the so-called eth killers right and i mean as you know like in crypto there's just so much noise and and so many kind of for sure. so many narratives a lot of hysteria uh, a lot of virtue signaling and and kind of cult like behavior <laughs> so it's hard you know sometimes it's hard to see the light of day you know and i guess yeah my my question is like how you know how how is avalanche going to uh, keep momentum and kind of maybe avoid some of the mistakes that previous I guess, I mean, even the term ETH killer is kind of a bit of a, a misnomer itself, right? Mm-hmm. Um, based mm-hmm. on our previous conversation, but... Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. To me, that's that's a big no-no from my perspective because right. I'm a very big fan of Ethereum. Mm-hmm. Um, always have been. What really got me thinking about the space. And I do think, you know, from a culture and community perspective, they're unmatched. And there's a reason for that. It's more of an ethos, you know, than just a, uh, than just a chain. So you know, from our perspective, I don't really view us as an ETH killer. Right. Uh, I think, you know, we're another chain out there. We're also, we're actually, a, you know, a network and we have, we provide various capabilities and possibilities that can interoperate with, with Ethereum. You know, uh, I, I like to tell people all the time that from a DeFi perspective, what's fascinating is where the governance lives. Mm-hmm. So right now, a lot of the governance lives on Ethereum uh, for the largest apps. And that's common, but... If the if if the governance lives on Ethereum, doesn't mean all the users and all the activity has to live on Ethereum. But still, the governance lives there, and if the governance lives there, it's still always going to play a very important part. And that's why I like to think of ETH as like kind of the settlement layer, mm-hmm. you know, across crypto right now. You know, the governance settles there. Um, you can have very important transactions settle there, but you're not going to run everything through there, even when it's a proof of stake ETH 2.0 chain. You know, the transactions per second that they're talking about, it's just not feasible to do everything we want to do. So, but, you know, it, it, it's incredibly secure. It's been around a long time and has fascinating culture. So with all that, you know, it allows it to be this fascinating settlement layer from my perspective, especially on the governance front. Right, right. Um, you know, it, it would be interesting to, to hear a little bit more about the the level of decentralization that that you know that you know you were speaking about earlier in, in avalanche and and um if you could explain mm-hmm. how that's achieved sure yeah i mean like i said we have over a thousand validators right now and it's been less than a year since mainnet so you know that if you compare that to some other chains right uh i think solana has um half of that or, or mm-hmm. roughly um polygon has you know, very little. 20 or something? <laughs> yeah, something like that. But I think two or three wrong. control a vast majority of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, I think Phantom, similar, right? Two nodes went offline and halted the network, if I remember correctly. For us, it's it's just different. And a lot of that's just because the way the consensus is designed. It's lightweight to run a node. It's not expensive to run a node. And the consensus is like some... Uh, so it, it's basically random subsampling to achieve consensus, but it's this very fascinating algorithm that I really suggest people who are interested in these kind of things read because it's unique. It's not, uh, you know, uh, doesn't it, it essentially, there's no sp- stated block time. Mm-hmm. Um, blocks can be, can be mined at various rates depending on activity. So it allows the system to be flexible. It's also uh, more difficult to have uh, MEV because, um, of the random subsampling and you know the window to actually uh, extract value as a validator in terms of time speed and you know just knowing when you're going to have the chance to is so much harder than other chains so that's a huge benefit for for avalanche you know relatively speaking to some other chains so yeah we think it's one of the biggest breakthroughs in consensus algorithms since since nakamoto consensus amazing and and could you uh, explain just briefly how the consensus works? Yeah, sure. So essentially, it's like there's there's all these nodes out there, and they kind of have some sort of uh, uh, random subsampling of what each node views as the next block. And 
uh, as that happens, as they continuously subsample these random nodes, they're each like gossiping effectively amongst themselves. And with that gossiping, uh, the way the algorithm is structured, they all kind of quickly achieve the same decision very fast. So I, from my perspective, it's something you wouldn't want for like, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's not the type of algorithm you'd want for uh, like, let's say, trying to figure out how we should, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to put this, but you know, trying to think of uh, which stock we should invest in, right? Like we, we don't want groupthink in those type of things. But for consensus, you probably do want groupthink. Um, you want you well. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but you definitely want people to quickly be able to determine whether or not they're going to get to the right to the same place together. And Avalanche like allows that. It allows them the most. All right, we were all going to get to. Let's say the decision was red or blue. We're all going to get to blue. How do we get to blue the fastest? And that's kind of what it, what it allows it to do that when you when you're trying to pick between two colors like red or blue. Right. And and how does how do the the sub chains kind of tie into how does consensus work with sub chains? Yeah. Well, the sub the subnets effectively are customizable and can allow you to run any type of VM you want. Like our C chain is an instance of the EVM, right? But it runs mm-hmm. on Avalanche consensus. So that's what, you know, you're essentially running Ethereum, but on Avalanche's consensus. So that's kind of cool. But on the custom subnets, you can run any VM you want, but you also can specify which validators you want in a permissioned way. But those validators also need to validate the main chain. So there, there is like some skin in the game for them, so to speak. And you can also create custom coins on those subnets. And so that, that, that consensus layer is lightweight and, and, be, and it's able to be ported throughout the subnets and also on the main chain. Right. So, so you're saying that Avalanche can effectively run instances of other blockchains. Mm-hmm. So, so what are like some, you know, some, some use cases of that? Uh, there's a lot of use cases, but like for me, it's, you know, uh, I think about like, I can't keep going back to the Uber example. Like uh, I think, you know, if you want to run decentralized Uber, um, you'd want to do it on a subnet most likely because you want to create your own coin. You want to have your own, uh, essentially you want to have your own validators and you can do it in a way where there's enough validators where it's, you know, sufficiently decentralized from a high level, but also, you know, um, such that you have validators that, you know, or that you that you know are are are, are trustworthy, sort of like kind of how bridging works mm-hmm. um, in crypto right now. But with that, you get incredible speeds, right? Because it's just your subnet running there, and 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 the throughput is much faster, mm-hmm. and especially with the consensus algorithm. So that's special. Also, you can define jurisdictions, right, for your validators, like or define whether or not they all want to be KYC. All these things can be, you know, programmed on chain where that doesn't really exist. Like, for example, uh, maybe this is a better example, but if you think about like kind of the way the CME works right now, like uh, settling uh, swaps Mm -hmm. for financial markets right now, that's one clearinghouse. That's a central entity. Mm -hmm. I think what would be better, you know, like as Goldman Sachs and Citigroup clear a swap, that swap clears through CME. It would be better if the CME effectively was a subnet where each one of the large banks was a validator on that subnet and they could clear the swaps amongst themselves rather than one single clearing house housing all that risk money power you know those banks effectively could do it amongst themselves but in a decentralized way on an actual public chain right that's the difference because even though it's a subnet it still it still rolls up to the main chain it's still a public chain and that's something that a lot of the financial market participants institutionals you know, haven't been trying to do for each, for these past few years. They've been trying to do this all on straight permission networks that they own. Right. And, and you know, is this kind of um, something that Avalanche is or that you guys are pursuing, like the, you know, kind of push for enterprise adoption? I mean, are you actually uh, engaged in discussions with, with any firms? On, yeah. On yeah. Yeah. I mean, for sure. You know, but on, on the financial market stuff, that's, you know, just my experience working at Citigroup. I worked there for seven years. These things take a long time, you know, to kind of get the compliance departments and, and, and legal on their side to be okay with these things. It's a long road. So for us, the chain is, is, is flexible enough to do a lot of things. So DeFi is fast and available today. And, you know, Avalanche is perfect for it. So we're going to pursue that. 
while we're also pursuing a lot of these enterprise things. Like I mentioned, you know, the tops for NFTs. We have other very large scale enterprise projects that are in the works yeah. that I haven't yet been announced. So those will also be forthcoming in the future. But, you know, I think that what's special about what we're doing is it's kind of flexible enough for all those things. Like, and the most important aspect of all of it is the decentralization. And that's what makes um, Avalanche available to, to use for all these types of uh, use cases, right? Because if you think about a, you know, very fast, very, very fast, but less secure chain, the last thing you want to settle on that type of chain is anything finance or mission critical. And that kind of limits your use case to games or, you know, uh, things like that. Amazing. I think that it's been a great kind of overview of what you, you know, what you guys are doing and, and, and building. And I think to kind of, to kind of wrap everything up, mm-hmm. I would say, how would you imagine, what are some of the milestones that Avalanche will have hit in, in a year? Yeah, that's a good question. I think some of the, some, some of the important milestones for me are usability. Number one, like, like I said, we were missing a lot of these infrastructure pieces and because of that, you know, it was very difficult to kind of have a ton of usability just by nature of, of missing those items. So having all, you know, getting real usability on the chain, proving that this consensus is scalable, is fast and does all the things we say it does. That's like number one for me, you know, because I can say it's all blue in the face, but until we prove it, show it, it doesn't matter. So I, you know, that's number one for me, but number two also is um, kind of, really getting the subnet conversation out there a little bit more uh, and, and, and really having people understand what the special nature of that, of that subnet feature is, you know, um, and displaying that via some use cases, which is stuff we're working on. So I think usability and really getting subnets out there are top of mind for me. Amazing. And, you know, for someone that was interested in, in Avalanche and was active in the, in the DeFi space, you know, are there any, are there anything that they can expect to see over the next little while? Yeah, there's a lot. I would stay tuned. There's a lot coming out this month in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you should, you know, kind of make sure you follow Avalanche on Twitter, and you know, I think you'll you'll be very very uh, interested to see all the announcements that we're going to be making this month, especially. So uh, I can't really give much away at this point, but uh, I'm very excited about it. Awesome, man. Well, you know, we're super excited to be integrated with, with Avalanche and, and really excited to to building some stuff together. So, you know, thanks a lot for coming uh, on the show today. And yeah, look forward to hearing some of that exciting stuff you were talking about. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was, you know, great conversation and I uh, look forward to doing more with you guys. Awesome. Thanks, Luigi. Cheers.